Hi everyone, this is Trevor Jones from astrobackyard.com and in this video I want to share with you some ultra top secret image processing techniques in Adobe Photoshop. Okay, they're not totally top secret, but they're some of my best tips I could possibly give you for processing astro photos in Adobe Photoshop. Some key steps that I take to really make a huge impact on your image. Uh, I do have an image processing guide. If this tutorial goes a little fast for you and you need more from the beginning stages step by step, you can find that in the description of this video. I'd really appreciate it. But this video is all about some kind of secret techniques that I use in all my astro photos and I think they can make a big difference in yours as well. So first off, let's just take a look at the data here. This is a stack of about an hour's worth of, I believe it's four minute exposures at ISO 800 of the Lagoon Nebula. So this was a color stock DSLR camera captured through a small 80 millimeter refractor telescope. The image has been converted to a 16 bit per channel image in Photoshop. The first thing I'll do here is open up the levels and kind of bring that shadow slider in a little bit. We're not losing any data. Uh, we're just creating some better contrast. And then I think we'll just do a quick curve stretch just to kind of see what we're looking at here. So kind of an S curve, not too aggressive. We don't want to blow out any of the highlights, but just create some more separation between the sky and see some of the fainter details in the Lagoon Nebula and the surrounding nebulosity. So there's the before and after there. And uh, there's already going to be some really interesting things to notice at this point. And this is what this video is all about. So going into the channels palette in Photoshop here, so you're probably used to layers, but if you break down an RGB image into channels, it says a lot about the data and you can really get a good look at things. So right off the bat, we can see that the, the amount of signal collected in each channel is different per channel and the red has a lot more information in this in this object anyway sometimes it's the blue in a reflection nebula and and so on but there's also things to notice like what channel is noisier than the rest so the green channel surprise surprise in a DSLR with that Bayer filter is has a cleaner signal with less noise than the red channel also how about the blue channel look at the size of the stars between the green channel and now the blue channel. So they're, they're glowing, they're a lot bigger and more bloated in that blue channel, which is very typical of a DSLR camera, a one-shot color camera. So looking at our image here, now we kind of have a better idea of what's hiding behind this full color image. The first thing we can do based on what we know now is that because that red channel is just a little bit noisier than the rest, why don't we select all, control A, Control C to copy, I'm on a PC, uh, create a new image and paste it. So now we just have our red channel isolated on its own. With on our new image of just the, the red channel isolated, grayscale, we'll go into the camera raw filter. Now this is so powerful in Photoshop, the camera raw filter. I use it for a lot of key actions, including noise reduction, sharpening, uh, contrast, uh, almost everything. But we're going to use the noise reduction feature in Adobe Camera Raw and just soften up this red channel only. The green channel was nice and sharp with, with great signal. We don't need to over... We don't need to use the noise reduction too aggressively in that green channel, but in the red it could really use it. So when we look at an image on a per channel basis like this, we can be a lot more selective with our processing. So why don't I just bump up the luminance noise reduction to 22 in the red channel only and apply that. Now this one subtle change is going to make a big difference to our full color image. On this layer again I'm going to select all, copy, and paste it into the red channel. So you have your channels palette open, highlighted on the red channel, I've pasted it in. So if we use the history palette, we can look at the before and after of that subtle change we made. Now the red channel is just a little less noisy. Now if we click on RGB, we can see our full color image again. And it's going to be a very subtle but important difference in the image at this point. From here, why don't we look at that blue channel and look at those stars. So before we do that, why don't you look at the, the see this blue glow around these stars? 
That's because look at the bloating in those blue stars. They're, they're not as sharp and in focus as the other channels. Now this is a triplet apochromatic refractor, so it has great color correction out of the box, so to speak. So they should be pretty close, and they certainly are compared to some of the other telescope um, designs. But at, clearly the stars are a little bit bigger in this channel, and we can, thankfully, we can do something about this. So with that blue channel selected in the, in the channels palette, we're going to copy it over and we can just use this frame again and we're gonna paste it on top. <clears throat> we'll just flatten this image so we don't get confused as to those other layers and anything we've done up to this point. Now, if you've watched my tutorials or if you've downloaded my guide, you'll know how I feel about the star minimizing actions and uh, techniques to reduce the size of the stars and how powerful that is when it comes to astrophotography image processing. So we're gonna reduce the stars in the blue channel only just to see what that does to our final color image. So to do that, we'll go to select color range. Uh, instead of sampled colors, we'll do highlights. And then just to get a rough indication of the highlights, we're gonna use the fuzziness and range sliders and somewhere around here is gonna select us the brightest stars, but unfortunately some of our nebula as well. So there's a couple ways to go about this. Uh, my favorite is to use the select and mask to refine the mask, essentially what we wanna select and you know, not touch or what we do want to, to, to adjust. You can do kind of a rough deselection by using the lasso tool here in the tools menu in the toolbar holding down Alt, and then you just simply draw around the areas that you don't wanna to touch. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, if I'm not careful here, I'm gonna be selecting some of those stars I wanna minimize as well, and, and you would be right. This is why image processing can take a long time, creating star masks and, and stuff like this. So you can see I've removed that area from the selection, which is great, but using the Select and Mask tool, we can really refine our, our mask and really see what, what we're working with. And that looks just hideous. It's, it's very unnatural the way I, I remove that area of stars. So this is where you know it can take some serious time to really refine your mask. But we can do a few adjustments here like feather. Feather is really important because as you can see, as I turn that up, it's softening the selection around those stars and we're getting a more accurate selection of, of what we want in a smooth transition between the background that we don't want to touch. Again here, we can now see the areas we missed uh, in our selection where we actually grab some of the nebula and I'm going to do the same technique using the lasso tool and uh, holding down alt to remove from the selection. Now I'll say this is very rough just for the sake of speeding through the video, but you can really spend a lot of time making sure those star masks are selected on just the brightest stars only and, and not the minimizing your, your nebula itself. But just for the sake of the video, I'm gonna keep going on, but really you'd wanna really refine that mask. Uh, you can use the contrast slider to create further separation between the, the darkness of the mask and the brightness of the mask. You can shift the edges to select even more and uh, feather is the most important so I'm gonna I'm happy with this mask here as as quickly as we did that now our stars ideally are selected only and we can go to filter other minimum now you want to make sure that preserve roundness is selected here and from what I've seen this was put in here for astrophotographers thanks to Adam Block I saw in one of his, his talks that he actually talked to Photoshop, the team at Photoshop into doing this roundness for this exact application. So with just a radius of one and the roundness, roundness selected, we're gonna apply that minimum filter and it did a very subtle change to those larger stars and I like to go into the history to see the before and after. And as you can see, those stars got smaller. So here's the before and there's the after. You can really see it on stars like this. Unfortunately, all these stars that are kind of sitting within the nebula weren't touched. And like I said, you have to go in and really uh, refine your mask to make sure that those are selected. With this blue layer and our star, our star minimized layer, I'm gonna select the whole thing, copy it, and you guessed it, paste it into that blue channel. 
Now you can really see the difference between the areas on the outer edge of where we, we did that star minimizing action. And now we get to the RGB portion. These stars here that we didn't touch still have that blue glow, but over here it's made a big difference. Look at it, it's just gone from these stars and we've actually managed to get all the colors to line up at once. And in this case, creating these white, naturally white stars, white bluish stars. So we have better star color across the board because of this action. We've, we've kind of matched and lined the colors up. And that's because we didn't minimize all the stars in the image on the RGB image, just that blue channel. So we can kind of line the stars up so they're kind of matching on each channel. Very, very powerful technique. Now that we've improved the, the noise reduction in the red channel and we've made those blue stars a little bit smaller, uh, we can actually do, now we're gonna look at the red channel. So um, the red channel in this object, and if you've ever heard people talking about uh, creating a luminance layer, and this is in my processing guide as well, um, a luminance layer basically is just the highlights of the image of your best signal, uh, and then layered on top to just enhance the bright areas of the image. It's an extremely powerful technique, whereas the before and after of adding a luminance layer can really make or break your image. So ideally you would be doing it for every single astrophoto you process. The trick is to build that luminance layer that's, you know, going to, you know, create, keep that natural look of your object, but also get kind of the most bang for your buck. So in this case, because that red channel is so strong, I'm going to select that red channel only and now paste that on our kind of the, the our file where we kind of play with things. So I'll just flatten the image. So that's all we're working with here. And why don't I just make some subtle adjustments to this red channel before I apply it as before I apply it as a luminance layer. In the tabs of Adobe Camera Raw, there's uh, this tone curve where you can actually use you know the traditional curve style, which is nice, or you can use this parametric, which I've been using a lot lately. So in these sliders, I'm going to move the lights up just ever so slightly and the highlights down because ideally those highlights are really the brightest stars we don't want to blow out and the lights are just kind of the bright areas that could be pushed a little further. I'm not going to touch the darks or shadows that would just bring the darks down you know what why don't I just bring the shadows down a little bit and so we've made a little bit of an adjustment there and then I'm also going to just look at that luminance. Perhaps we could just bump up the noise reduction ever so slightly. And even using this mask, I'm holding down the, the Alt key here and then bump up the sharpening a little bit. You got to be really careful here. You don't want to get carried away. I'm just going to do very little sharpening. Now we've brightened up our red channel that we're going to be using as a luminance layer ever so slightly. To balance things out, I want to grab some details from that clean green channel and a little bit from the blue as well, just to kind of normalize the colors. So I'm selecting the green channel and I'm actually going to paste it on top of this as a layer, but not keep it at 100%. Ideally, 50% would work well, then you're kind of just adding a little bit of, of that green channel highlights in there too. So all of the colors are being represented in terms of brightness. I'm going to bump it right down to 33% because I'm really interested in that red channel brightness and I don't want to take too much away from it. The same thing with this blue channel. I'm going to grab that just for fun and paste that on top. And that one I might do even less. I'll put that at 20% just to say that we included it. So really, it's mostly the red channel, but we've added some blue and green just to kind of normalize things. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. So I'll copy our luminance layer we created and paste it on top of our RGB image as a layer. So I'm just double checking the channels. I've got RGB selected. And as a new layer on top, we're gonna paste our luminance layer. So the big thing for a luminance layer is, surprise, surprise, changing the blending mode to luminosity rather than just normal. So straight off the bat, 
we've brightened up the bright areas, but unfortunately also the dark areas, we've lost a lot of contrast. So you want to knock down the opacity of that luminance layer, and then even better, using curves on the luminosity layer, you want to bring it down something similar to this curve. Now you can really spend a lot of time getting this right and getting the right balance. You might want to go into the levels as well because you don't want to lose too much contrast, but you do want to brighten up those areas. So look at the difference between, and I'm just going to bump up the luminosity just a little bit. Look at the difference between before and after of that lumin luminance layer. It's brought out some of these fainter areas and because I've, I've brought the curves down and increased the contrast, it hasn't brightened up the dark areas too. So that layer is a very subtle difference, but it can make it can actually be very powerful. And the opacity, that the, the amount that you choose to, to apply is up to you. You can just use the straight red layer in terms of if you are capturing images with a narrow band hydrogen alpha, that red channel is going to be very strong on a colored camera. You can directly apply that as a luminance layer too, and that adds a huge punch to emission nebulae. But I think you get the idea for adding that luminance layer and what it can do. So now that we've done all that, we've kind of looked at each channel separately. I'm just going to create a new visual merge on top. Again, looking at the channels, and you can go in even further. So for me, I sometimes I like to use these astronomy actions. If you've seen me talk about the astronomy tools action set before, rather than just applying the action, one of my favorite ones is enhance DSO and reduce stars because it's kind of a one click magical button. So here I'll just apply it to the RGB image as a whole. And it's, it's going to have a really uh, incredible effect on the image. With that done, just balancing out, setting the gray point here. And again, if I'm going too fast, I apologize. Check out the guide if you need to slow down. Here's that one click of that action, which, you know, it's the star reduction. That's the biggest reason why this creates such a more dramatic image. So what if instead of applying that effect to the RGB image as a whole, we went through each channel and applied that effect and then merged the, the, the channels together into one. Then you can run the action again on the full RGB image. I think you're starting to understand why it's important to work on the image on a per channel basis. You have more control, you can do several iterations of the same effect in a very precise way and you really have complete control over the data and you don't need something like PixInsight to, to do that. You have the power of creating these advanced and very refined masks. You can make these adjustments on a per channel basis and create incredible RGB color images.